Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday online service. Why don't we to close your eyes and uh, contemplate uh, what I really want uh, in my life? You can close your eyes. What do I ultimately want in my life? You can open your eyes now. Probably what I want is uh, better health or more successful career or more nicer car, etc. But what we really want, ultimately want, is uh, the happiness or freedom in our life. Why we would like to have a better relationship with the others or become successful in our workplace, etc. It's all to achieve that goal. But the problem is uh, we do not know the path how to achieve that goal. We think we know, but we may not know the exact path. Do you know when you become Buddhist, then we receive 10 precepts or the basic five precepts, the code of conduct, moral code, do not kill, do not steal, do not use a harsh language, or do not lie, or do not commit a sexual misconduct. Or in one Buddhism, the last precept is uh, don't be lazy, don't be ignorant, etc. Do you know observing these precepts is very critical for you to achieve a happiness or freedom of a life? Or, do you really believe or realize the karmic principle of a cause and effect? You harvest what you saw exactly. We may not know the path to happiness or freedom of mind. That's the first reason. The second reason is, even though we know the path. We actually don't walk that path. Knowing is one thing, walking the path is another. One of my father's friend is a medical doctor for, for his whole life, but he suffered from diabetes. After he retired, he drank a lot. So he finally lost his eyes. He could not see. He became blind. As a medical doctor, he very clearly know how harmful it is to the person to drink a lot to the person with a diabetic symptom. Think about the, you may know how to break your bad habits or how to lose the weight to become more healthier. But actualizing that is not that easy. The first reason, we do not know the path. The second reason, people don't actually walk the path. There may be two reasons. For people not to live a contented, free, or happy life. When psychology professor in Yonsei University in Korea conducted a very interesting uh, research. What is the reason for people successful 
in their life, particularly in their occupation. So he folk, uh, he conducted a survey on a small elementary school in Gyeongnam province. That school is very small, located in the rural area. He collected a, a lot of uh, data. The student's IQ, the first element. The second is uh, the student's uh, grades, the academic achievement, how well or how poorly they did in school. And the third thing was uh, the teacher's evaluation of the students, of the, the students' conduct, how they are getting along with their fellow students uh, or how they are very positive, etc. What he discovered was, uh, first, the students' IQ has nothing to do with their success in their occupation. He thought the students' academic achievement is uh, significantly related uh, how much money they make, um, uh, how, how they are expected, uh, etc in their own area, but it is not that significantly related. Surprisingly, the teacher's evaluation of the students, I don't think most of the teacher evaluated their students in a serious way, but the student's evaluation of the student's behavior conduct is very much so significantly related with the future success of the students. The conclusion of that research is people would like to become happy by becoming successful in their life. I would be happy I become more successful in my life. That's the most of the people's mindset. But this research shows if you would like to become successful in your life, you need to be happy first, not the other way. There are a lot of other statistical research in the same hospital, for example. Some patients are more optimistic or more contented in their life. The chance for the patients with that type of a mindset to, to get healed quickly is far, far higher. When my external conditions become perfect, I become more successful in my occupation, better health, better relationship, etc. Then I would become happy. This type of a mindset is like if you are a climber, when we hike to the top of the Cascade Mountain, only after I stand at the top of the mountain, I will enjoy myself. We need to learn to enjoy our life each and every step when we hike to the mountain. Our life itself is a process. So our founding master said, the study of any science has a limit to its use, but if you learn how to make the mind function, this study can be utilized without a moment's interruption. Therefore, mind practice becomes the basis for all other practice. The path 
to happiness or the path to get the liberation of our mind is in our mind. Mind practice is the path, fundamentally speaking, to achieve happiness in our life. Mind practice, when they say Buddhist practice, it specifically means mind study and mind practice. The second reason people cannot achieve happiness in their life is even though they know the path. Well, I realize the mind practice is important, but the thing is that we have to actually walk the path. Buying good navigator is not enough for you to reach to, to the destination. You actually have to drive. But think about uh, breaking your bad habits or forgiving others, letting go of resentment, or whatever area they are. It's not easy to put that into action. If we forgive that person, if I let go of this or that attachment, I would become a far more liberated person. But it's not easy to put that into action. That's why we need to train our mind. Just like we train our dog, just like soldiers are trained in the military camp. When we exercise, when we train our body, all the muscles become more stronger. In that way, we need to train our mind. Do you know how many people are there in the emergency unit in the general hospital because they were beaten by dogs? They were beaten by dogs, their pet, because the dogs were not trained. Untrained mind is far more dangerous. Or your bad habits, jealousy, comparing mind, or kind of the unwholesome state of our mind in our life, fundamentally originate from untrained mind. So Buddha said, training, what could be more meritorious than training your mind? It's the, what the Buddha's word. How can we train our mind? Specifically, what does that mean to train our mind? When we say mind practice, what does that mean? Training our mind means threefold practice, threefold training, making our mind calm and peaceful. We usually call that spiritual cultivation. That's why we meditate, training our mind very wide. That's why you listen to this Dharma talk or read the scripture. The training our mind so that our mind can be righteous. Your mind can be very alert and mindful. So that in your daily life, uh, you can actually put that in action, what you really believe. In one Buddhism, we usually call that mindful choice in action. So training our mind is practicing our mind so that our mind can be peaceful, stable, and wise, and righteous, and courageous. That is the path. We usually call that as a threefold practice. Our third head of Dharma Master, Venerable Tesan, said, different religion, different tradition labored that practice in a very diverse way. But essentially, whether it's a 
Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, it's all the same. The path to nirvana is one and the same, the threefold path. Mind the practice one. Why don't you close your eyes and think all together? Do I, probably you have heard the mind the practice many times before, but do I really seriously consider mind the practice is directly related for my achieving happiness or liberation of our mind? Let's contemplate just for one minute, closing the eyes. Now you can open your eyes. Training our mind or mind practice is a journey, a inner or spiritual journey. Just like uh, when we drive, sometimes we encounter some uphill, steep hill. In this journey, in this particular journey, we encounter many obstacles. So many hindrances. The hindrances may not be, for example, when you meditate as some snoring person next to you or uncomfortable seat or unsympathetic spouse, etc. They may be kind of an obstacle. Right? But true obstacle in this better, true enemy troop is uh, very mental. Your disbelief, laziness, ignorance, this kind of thing. Or the obstacles that you encounter in your life basically originate from your inner mental obstacle because of that enemy. Our founding master or Buddha used some military terminology, a better world, better between Mara and the Dharma. In order to win a war, fighting very hard is very important. But what's very important is we need an ally, a friendly troop. That makes a very big difference. For example, our Sangha or teacher, Dharma friends can be your friendly troops. But there's a more important, more truthful friendly troops in our practice or life. Our founding master said that as four articles to progress. The first friendly truth is faith. The second, zeal or passion or courage. The third is the questioning mind. The fourth friendly truth is Dedication, sincerity and the dedication. If you think your practice is not going well, or you're not that successful in some area, in human relationship or in your career, whatever area, it is because maybe 
you don't have a disfriendly truth. Faith, zeal, questioning mind, and dedication. For example, when you decide, you get up early in the morning and you plan to drive to Washington, D.C., you start the engine. Wow, you can hear strange noise from your car. Your car starts to rattle, to trembling. How can you drive that car the long distance? Because you cannot trust that vehicle. We would like to live a perfectly happy or liberated life. But people do not know the path, the exact path or shortcut. So who knows that path exactly? For example, my mother loved me very much. I do not have to ask to my mother because she does not know the path exactly, even though she cares dearly for me. Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas are the persons who know the exact path. That's why you listen to the Dharma talk or read the scripture in order to know or learn the path. Our founding master said, even though I didn't graduate from the elementary school, for one thing, I know for sure. I know for sure how to make you Buddha, how to help you to reach to Nirvana. In this area, I know quite sure. So the first element is faith. The second is the zeal. Another translation for Poon is passion, courage, zeal, etc. When you drive to a certain destination, why some people arrive there quickly? Why for some practitioner it takes a lot of time? One of the reasons, maybe the main reason is uh, do I drive to that destination with a great zeal, passion, and courage? Zeal, according to our one Buddhism scripture, it's defined in this way. Zeal means a mind that heroically moves forward which is the motive force that encourages and pushes us along when we try to accomplish anything. The literal transition of zeal, boon, do you know, it, it literally means anger, anger. When you're angry, your mind is so focused and full of energy. You can do anything. You are really, really mad. As a meditation teacher, I taught how to overcome drowsiness, wandering thoughts, etc. There are many skillful ways and the techniques depending on the tradition. But what I discovered was if that person does not have a resolute state of mind, if he is not determined, if he does not have a passion or zeal, not any technique will work. It's the same in our career. It's the same in whatever area. The third friendly trope is Questioning mind, for example, in our journey to attain complete liberation, we drive 
our vehicle and encounter some big obstacle. Some are big, some are small, but uh, pushing that obstacle, like a bulldozer or forklift, it's uh, like uh, carrying out our practice uh, with a solid face and the zeal. But sometimes, if there is an obstacle in front of us, uh, instead of uh, pushing that obstacle away, why don't we go around in order to enter some house? You can break the door uh, if you are strong, but why don't we first uh, try to search the key at the porch. Sometimes we have to use our mind or brain. Questioning mind is very important. I, ever since I became a one Buddhist minister, I practice sitting meditation a lot, probably a little more than the average one Buddhist minister. My meditation is not that bad, quality-wise. But why I could not go very deep in meditation? Just like the, the Buddhist master experienced. I thought about that. Is that because I did not invest enough energy or time for that? That may be the truth. But I discovered that's not the primary reason. Because uh, I have a lot of attachment in my mind, in our life. If uh, this mind, let's just say, this mind, our life, is like a ship, it is uh, about to embark the journey to nirvana. If that ship, is a tied with a lot of ropes. How can it embark the journey to the best ocean? So the primary reason for me not to go very deep in meditation is not because I spent a lot of time on the meditation. It's because of so many attachments. So these days, one of my items of mindfulness is letting go, letting go. I don't perfectly carry that out, but having that item in my mind, in my daily practice, really helped me to have some liberated state of mind, very free state of mind. Questioning mind. The last thing is dedication. In one Buddhist scripture, dedication says, dedication means unremitting state of mind, which is the motive force that will achieve the objective when we try to accomplish anything. Spiritual journey is not short track. It's a marathon. If you would like to achieve some grand or greater thing, it takes more time. It's more difficult to achieve that. That's the law of the universe, which you cannot change. The hare and the tortoise story, when, what we learned in the elementary school, it's a great, great lesson to the practitioner. Steady and slow win the race. Before I moved to the One Dharma Center, I worked at the One Institute of Graduate Studies, which is a home Buddhism seminary. We all lived together along with the minister in the dormitory, which used to become the Westminster Seminary dormitory. It's a very old building. After morning meditation, 
or people, ministers and the prime minister, uh, clean their own area before breakfast, around 30 minutes. My area was the basement. When I first uh, went down to the basement and uh, turned off the light, uh, I was very much surprised. It's a very spacious area, as big as this meditation hall, with uh, a lot of stuff like all the furniture. But on the floor, there were so many centipedes. How could uh, there are so many centipedes in one spot? I could see more than 20 centipedes. As soon as I turn on the light, they start to move, out, move away. So I started uh, to catch with a broom and the pan. I started to sweep inside the pan and uh, throw that away. The next day, it's the same number, like 20 centipedes. I went to the Home Depot. We have a special formula to get rid of the centipedes. They didn't carry with that kind of a, a formula, chemicals. Do you know what I did? I didn't pray for that. <laughs> In each and every morning, after morning meditation, I caught those centipedes. Continuously, after six months, it almost disappeared. I'm not sure there they were scared of me or. <laughs> In many areas, uh, there is not any special skill or method. It is doing something repeatedly until we achieve our goal. That is uh, dedication. That's the fourth friendly troops. So in our spiritual practice, uh, it's very natural that we encounter many obstacles and the hindrances. When you go to the uh, Buddhist monastery in Asia, there is a medi main meditation temple. It says, uh, De Ung Jan, De Ung Jan, which literally means the hall of great hero. Who's a great hero? Shakyamuni Buddha is enshrined in the middle. He's a hero because he conquered, he subdued our inner mental enemies. How? With a great face, zeal, questioning, mind, and dedication. So I'd like to say again, if things does not go well as you expect or want, you seriously need to reflect do I really have these friendly troops or not? Probably three for the practice or four articles of progress you have heard before. And our founding master finished writing one Buddhist canon, a couple of his followers asked, wow, he wrote that in Korean. In those days, uh, learned people worshipped Chinese literature. They say, it's so easy, so plain. But our founding master asked to them, can you practice it? After Sunday, Dharma talk, uh, these days uh, I don't receive uh, the feedback, but uh, before the COVID-19, some people come to me and they say, Reverend, you were 
I loved your talk. Your talk was great. But I'm not here, or you are not there, to evaluate the talk. Our mindset should be shifted. Some people said, I learned a lot, but that's better. There are many people at the One Dharma Center or Philadelphia, One Temple, they learned a lot and lived the Sangha because they think there is nothing more to learn anymore. We read the scripture, we come to the Sangha, we join the service, not for learning, in order to practice that in our daily life. That is the direction. So the guru response uh, should be, sometimes uh, they say in this way, wow, because of your talk, I could uh, reflect my practice, reflect uh, my life. It really helped. That is the direction of listening to the Dharma talk or, or our learning uh, scripture. One last story. There is a one Korean, one Buddhist, who practiced one Buddhism for a very long time. He learns a lumber business. He imports lots of uh, uh, cut tree, the log, and uh, this sell that in Korea. But one day he discovered He's a business partner for the for a long time. He was a completely swindler. He may lose all his business that he built for his whole life. He was so mad and he decided his mind to kill that person. So with that business partner, he went to Indonesia. In some aisle, the lumber factories are located. They were alone just that there were two persons in a boat. So his plan was just to push him out of the boat. Who knows? It's a remote island. But at the moment, he recalled our founding master's message that's in the discourse of Sotesan, when students asked how what can I do so that I don't get attached to either hatred or love? That our founding master replied, the method for remaining free of attachment to hatred of love depends on knowing how to redirect your thoughts well. Redirecting your thoughts well. That passage arose in his mind and he changed his plan. So, whether it is online or some physical Sangha, we are here not for the sake of learning. Why do we learn? To put that into practice in our life. Just like that businessman, lumber businessman. So today, probably three for the practice, four articles of progress, you may read that, but uh, why don't we deeply reflect, do I really have that friendly truth? So why don't you close your eyes and contemplate that for one minute?
Thank you.